course, I was Army. I started out Fort Jackson, um, South Carolina. That's where I did basic AIT at. And after that, um, I went to Korea, um, Red, Camp Red Cloud, um, which was in Weejambu. So um, that's where I started out at, man. That, that was a fun experience, man. I mean, a lot of it, when I look back at it, I kind of wish that I did things a little bit different. And what I mean by that, um, I wish I got to um, really, really enjoy Korea. I, I enjoyed it, but I think at that time in my life, man, I partied the whole time. So a lot of my experience <laughs> in Korea came from partying, having fun, young 21-year-old kid wilding out, just acting crazy, man, doing what a country boy like me would do. You know, this, this, um, especially because um, it was the first time I left Korea. I mean, I left South Carolina and actually was on my own up until 21. I was a porch baby, as they call it, man. Somebody who was home all the time. I mean, I really didn't venture off much by myself. So um, I think one of my biggest problems was I didn't know how to handle the real world, being on my own, especially because I was always home with family, mom, dad, telling me what to do. So finally, when I left home at 21, and I, I wouldn't say that was the first time I was actually home alone, but actually home alone, um, I mean, home. That, that was the first time I was actually away without actually being around family. So majority of my time there, man, I enjoyed it. But again, I partied most of that time. So Korea was very fun. Um, of course, I was a diesel mechanic. And I would say majority of my time there, I actually did 88 mic work, which is actual driving, You're driving trucks, all that stuff. So that's practically what I did the whole time with drive. I did a lot of, I did a little bit of mechanic work, but majority of my time I was I spent driving. And just enjoying Korea because with Korea, they have a lot of different holidays. We had like Katusha Friendship Weekend, Katusas. Um, those are the guys who actually um were rock soldiers, but they had a little bit more money than the actual Korean army. So their parents would kind of pay for them to actually work with us. So most of those guys, um, because I don't remember actually seeing any female. Korean soldiers, if I if, if I'm if I'm saying that correctly, I don't remember seeing them. And if they did have, them, I, I never seen them. But the males, they would actually be living with us, doing what we do. And I mean, that's just practically how it was in Korea, man. When it came to just being around Koreans and soldiers, and I mean, it's a beautiful country, man. I mean, they experienced monsoon season. Um. It was just a beautiful place, man. I mean, it's hard to really describe it because I don't know too many places that I can compare to Korea. I just know I enjoyed it. That's why, I like, when I first, when I had one of my first dogs after the Army, I called her Asia because I always say Asia was my favorite country. So, I mean, man, I, I love Korea. I almost got married there, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> when I met my first Black and Korean, and I, um, I kind of fell in love, as they say. Or most people say that was lust. So um, that, that's that's when my life started out in the army in Korea. How long were you there? A whole year. I stayed there a whole year. I didn't take AIT. I mean, I didn't take break or whatever. I stayed there the whole time. And your whole time was twelve months that you stayed there. Yes, sir. I didn't take no leave at all. I I, I stayed there the whole year. Most people take leave before the twelve, but for me, it was just like, man, this is my first time being away from home. So I took advantage of just being able to be there, but I did take 30 days of leave after I left the room. Okay, that's pretty good. Now I like that. And so you pretty much enjoyed the whole experience. How was the food? Oh man, you know, I'm a South Carolina boy, so they had rice. Let's just, let's just stop right there, rice. <laughs> <laughs> they, had a lot of, they had a lot of rice that I love, man. They love steamed rice. So I mean, when it came to the food, I mean, that's the first time when I was there. That um, that was one of the first times I ever actually enjoyed on um, what they call a the Mongolian bar. They had like this um little plate list, like in their restaurant. They had this thing where you can actually cook your food. So versus them cooking the food, they actually supplied the food and you cook it. But that's why you had to know a Korean female and you chill with her and. You know, they bring out the soju and she cook it and y'all sitting there drinking soju, eating. So that was my experience with the food. I mean, they had so many different styles of food. That was actually the first place I've ever been at to where they actually put teriyaki on a burger. 
Now that was different. <laughs> I go to the McDonald's because they had this thing called Beast Blaster where um they had this um big old um festival down in I think it was Pusan or whatever, like near the beach, um, which that was a whole different experience because like the way the beaches work here and there is two different things. Like our beaches, the water stayed near the coast. With their beaches, after like it started getting like a little bit dark, the water start going back in. So it's like they enjoy their beaches when the tide is in, but then at a certain point in time of their day, the water actually um, recedes and goes back closer to, I guess, the backside of the ocean or whatever, and it just like moves away. So it's like it's not like how our beaches is um, are, but it's real fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. But like when they come down to their food, um, it's just way different, man. Like you actually see live animals. They don't kill it before they cook it. So when you go and you go look at their markets and stuff, you see live food. You're like, hold up, bro. Like that's a live squid or that's a live fish or <laughs> whatever it is that they got. Mm. They like this live. So it's not like actually how our stuffs um are like sitting in the freezer, um, dead and already processed. They process a majority of food right then and there, which is pretty unique because now you get to see where your food coming from. Okay, now how was the, now you mentioned about the seasoning earlier. What's the difference, the big difference between, since it's something that's live that you're cooking here, if we get something, it's already been somewhat seasoned and frozen. What's the difference in the taste? With, I would say their live? stuff is freshly seasoned. I would say they, they use a lot more herbs and, spices than we do like they use actual natural stuff like even like on one of their biggest thing is ginseng they use actual natural products so i mean to be honest with you it's actually a whole lot more healthier and better like it tastes a whole lot different even down to the mcdonald's like they um actually change their oil or you go in there and they have like life cycles on their oil to where they don't keep the same oil in their um, fry cooker or things that fry, like they don't keep the same oil burning all day and cooking it in and cooking um cooking with that all day. They actually change it out. So for me, I, I would say they they really are some healthy people. Even down to the fact that when you riding through Korea in a taxi cab or on the train, you will see like an actual like park in the middle of Korea, and you will see like from old to young folks out there exercising at a certain time of day. And I'm talking about look like the whole town is out there. Ain't just like one or two people. It look like that's what they do as a people. So one of the things I've noticed over there was the older folks over there, they're fit. <laughs> they way fit. You don't <laughs> see too many obese because one of the things I've learned from their culture, they don't like OB, obese people. They're kind of like, hey, now nah, you need to be fit. And if you aren't, you kind of get ragged on for that, or as most of oh. the high side of the T. So they, they're very big on fitness and keeping yourself healthy. And the way you, you know, you basically take care of yourself. They, they're very big on that. Look, I like that. So also you mentioned that there was certain parts of the season. And it's really, that's 12 months is like not very much time because only you somewhat have four seasons where we are. How many seasons that you have there? To be honest, I don't remember, but I do remember it was hot. I do remember <laughs> monsoon season when it rained. And then I do remember it um, being real cold wintertime. And then I would say they had spring too. So I, I believe they had every season, but their seasons was a whole lot different due to the fact, I guess, the geographical location of where South Korea was. So it was a little bit different because when they got cold, oh my God, it was freezing. Oh. I'm talking about freezing cold. I remember being up in those mountains during the time we had field exercises. And I mean, I'm talking about it was so cold to where we trying to drive stakes down into the ground, but the ground was actually frozen because it was that cold to where, man, it was like, <laughs> it, it was freezing cold. And then we actually had um, what they call pot belly stoves. And it's basically like just this um, old metal container where you basically um using diesel fuel to fuel the fire and it, it, it was crazy it was crazy man it's, it's a different type of coal over there so that was my first time experiencing like actually extreme cold weather like the cold over there i can say it was second to none but then monsoon season was a whole nother thing it's just like how it was when i'm from the south Carolina where we have um hurricanes 
while you had that type of weather throughout a point in season um, in Korea too. And then when it um, comes to um, it being hot, it got hot. It, I won't say it was extremely hot, but you know, with asphalt and being in a city, city type area, that's a different type heat versus how the country is or well, I'm from the South Carolina, it's more humid. So I would say Korea was more like, almost like Texas, but not as hot. Okay, I like that. So how was your military experience there, doing your training, the people, how was that? Um, for me, like I said, I was a diesel mechanic. So most of my time there as a diesel mechanic, I was actually in the support battalion. So we supported infantry. And most of our time we spent setting up tents, um, doing a lot of field projects and um. It was pretty fun. It was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed it. Um, what I would say is I didn't do much of my job as a diesel mechanic there again because I worked for this um actual motor pool called Geronimo Tech. And um G Tech was basically the motor pool for General Ramirez, which was a one-star general at the time. So I got to work not hand to hand with him, but I was working indirectly from him, but I did get to meet him, see him be around them. So that, I would say that was probably a cool experience. Um, most of the time for me, because I was on Camp Red Cloud, most of the people who lived beside me or around me were either sergeant majors, generals, majors. So I got to be around a lot of the big league people. So I would say for me, that was very big and very, um, had a big influence on my career because it taught me a lot about the army. So versus coming in the army kind of being brand new to how the army functions, runs on um, um, either one you want to say. Um, for me, it was it was like, man, it was a big deal because they taught me the game of the army. They taught me what air, what AR 670-1 really stood on um, for and like how to maneuver through the army. Because one thing about the army is a lot of politics involved. There's a lot about um how to get promoted, um, having the right schooling and different things, because it's unlike being in the civilian world to where everybody's on like different levels, so to say, like even in there, people are on different levels, but at the same time, like think about it, we all come in as ground level people and you got to work your way up. And sometimes you can get promoted um, at the needs of the army. And then at a certain point, it's all about your military education. It's all about the extra stuff that you do. You know what I'm saying? So it's a lot of that, that, um, if you have the right people around you, they can help you with, and that's what Korea was for. Um, that, that's what Korea had. Um, that's what Korea helped me with a lot, man. I mean, just being around those type of people, um, especially because I had people who saw so much in me. They were trying to help me become a warrant officer. They sent me back to fast class to actual up my GT score. So I was, I really enjoyed Korea a whole lot because I mean, I got to learn a lot, and it had a lot of. Um, bearing on my career to where it helped me get to the next level. Okay, now, you mentioned that you got the training that you wanted, the location, the time frame was about a, just about a year. So your whole experience there pretty much, you enjoyed it. Yes, sir. You agree. You, yeah, I, you didn't, young, I didn't want to so come back. Enjoyed it. I actually didn't want to <laughs> come back. But the only reason why I came back was because during my time in the military, um, being deployed was one of the biggest things people talked about. Like you meet soldiers and people who deployed and the biggest thing they stressed was like, hey, bro, you got to get a deployment. You got to go down range. You got to go fight. Like you just can't stay in Korea or you can't stay someplace to where you don't deploy because that's one of the things that people don't know about the military. There are actual duty stations and places you can go where you never go down range. So just because people join the military, don't mean that they go downrange and they fight what they call war. Not not everybody does that because I met, um, I had a first sergeant, she was there and I would say out of her whole career, she spent 11 years in Korea, never came back to the States. I met mm -hmm. people who actually lived in Korea as former soldiers for 30 years and never went back to America. So Korea is one of those duty stations at that time where you can hide and, you know, go around a system which, you know, put people in that cycle of, hey, you here, you got to deploy. So that was what made me leave. It, it, just being around those seasoned soldiers who put in my mind like, hey, bro, you need to deploy and experience what Afghanistan or Iraq at the time was all about. Okay, so also now let me ask you about this. What about the money? How 
how was that with the American money versus the your money? Over there, they had one. They had this thing called one. Um, what I would say about one at the time when I was there, our money was valued at a little higher rate than the actual Korean one, but our money fluctuated based off of the stock market. So if the stock market was up on the American dollar, then I would, you know, when I give them money, I would exchange my money for their money and I would get more back in their money. But the uh, more and more that gap closed, the less and less I started getting back. And that's one of the things that I was able to experience and see was that our money and the value of our money through time is actually becoming like trash in a sense, man. And I believe even in the time we're living in now, like folks trying to figure out why we're suffering so much from inflation, I believe because the more and more the government puts out our money, the less and less our money is worth. So when people think, oh, they're putting out more money, nah, that's not always a good thing because it causes it to go down in value. You know, that's a lot of economical stuff we ain't gonna talk about, but it means a lot when they're putting out money. And that's one of the things that people don't realize and it's hard to see that, especially when you are in our country where that money is valued. But then you go someplace like how it was for me in Germany, our money was trash. Like going over to Germany and spending our money, oh man, it, it was horrible. Like I would go to McDonald's and in our money, you know, it would be like safe. And it was like probably like 20 or 30, um, what their money called? Um, they call it a euro, 20, 30 euro in their money. I would have to spend 40 or $50 in a McDonald's of our money because our money was that bad. Hmm, I did not know that. Yeah. I always thought that because from America that our money was always worth more, but you're saying that that's not always the case. Nah, it's, it's not. It's not just depending on the country. Cause I mean, I would say someplace like Afghanistan, yeah, our money is God over there because their economy is a whole lot different. I won't say they actually poor, all of them, but the system is, there. there isn't a system for wealth over there. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why you have a lot of foreigners that want to come to America because there's a will that has been created to where everybody can benefit from it. I know most folks feel like, oh, black folks, we were oppressed and we're not entitled. Nah, bro, the will has been created to where everybody can actually earn a um earn an income to where they can live lovely over there if you poor you live poor you die poor there is no such thing as rising to the top there is no such thing as the afghan dream over here in america we have a thing they call the american dream where anybody who put the work in and apply themselves they can benefit from it and i and i don't care where you're from i know folks may like to believe that that's not true but I think sometimes people need to take a trip outside of our country to see what true poor people are like. I remember in Korea, um, I seen the, one of the most um, one of the most memorable moments. I remember I met somebody who was actually poor. I remember this guy. He was um, he lost his legs and his arms, and he was actually on a skateboard. Like he actually sat his body on a skateboard and was actually wheeling himself through the crowd. I remember seeing people mentally challenged over there, and these people actually had to go work regular jobs or live a normal life as if they didn't have a disability. And that's because there aren't systems over there like social security and different things that we have over here. Those folks don't have that. Like it's either you get it or you don't. And I think that's what people don't really realize. They always try to, you know, bring up all these different narratives. Oh man, as black people, we've been oppressed and we can't like, brother, nah, we ain't oppressed, bro. If you go someplace else and see what they have going on, you understand in other countries, slavery still exists. Like that's another thing that folks don't realize. When I was in South Korea, I seen, you know what I'm saying, the Filipinos being enslaved by the South Koreans. And that's something that's going on to this day. You know, on one of the, um, the names that they have for the women, they call them juicy girls. That's the girls who work the club. And those girls, they're actually there as slaves in a sense to where they're over there on a debt. And until that debt is paid off, they're owned by the South Koreans. So when people talk about slavery and something that happened 400 years ago, it's hard for me to kind of like understand what they're talking about when I know what I've seen. Like you can't take away those memories and images of what's going on right now. Like I'm not talking about no 400 years. I ain't talking about Jim Crow, which, you know, that period came, went. 
And I'm talking about what's going on to this day. And that's one of the things that folks don't see. Like, it's, it's a lot more going on around this world than people really realize. And I think sometimes really people need to leave to see it. Because now, uh, from your perspective of it, you saw a lot of things that a lot of us didn't see. I was, always, although I was in the military, I was pretty much here, stateside, uh, Colorado, uh, then Fairbanks, Alaska, like forever. But okay. your experience was totally different. You know, the people yeah. that you saw, the, the how things were like a lot different because we're talking about the poor lifestyle here. The way you described the poor lifestyle there was, my God, it was. Man, totally it's, the it's the same way it would be in Afghanistan. I remember, um, like I said, there's no actual child care system. So over there in Afghanistan, say for instance, a kid loses his parents. Who who go pick that kid up? Who go and help that kid, that child out? There's no CPS or in South Carolina they call it DSS. There is no system that's okay. We are gonna put you up for adoption. Like I remember seeing a little four year old kid carry a little two one year old kid around with no parents. And now that child is left to figure out life for that child as if that child is an adult. I see things like that. So whereas we're complaining about, oh man, our people poor, they're out here on the street, da da da, but they can go to a soup kitchen. There's always some kind of, you know, make it with foundation or, you know, it's always some kind of organization that's always trying to help these people out versus over there. Those systems don't exist. Again, if you were in a situation, brother, whatever situation you were born into, 90% of the time, that's not to say there may not be 10 or 1% of the time where those people rise above that, but 90% of the time from what I saw, and it could have been just my limited area uh, where I was at that I only saw a certain view of certain things, but from what I can remember, nah, there aren't no systems over there. And I got to see real life to where I couldn't believe these folks were still living in mud huts. Like that baffled me. I'm talking about houses built out of brick and mortar, like the biblical days that you read about. Like I thought people stopped living like that. I remember seeing these folks pump water. If they wanted to go to the bathroom, they squat on the side of the highway. There weren't no bathrooms, no gas station you stopped to to use the bathroom or no gas station so you could get some beef jerky, cold soda. Like that stuff, that's not to say it's not there. But the areas I was um, stationed at, I didn't see that stuff. And that threw me for a loop. Like, I can't believe folks don't live like this. And it's not by choice. Like, here I know we can watch shows the way you got people who like to live in the mountains. And it's by choice. Over there, there is no by choice. That's actually how people live. Outside of Kabul, which is the major city in Afghanistan. So, again, you see that. Even like um, one of the things I learned about South Korea, most people used to tease them, hey, they eat cats and dogs, but that wasn't by choice. That was actually because at one time the country was so poor, they had to eat what they could eat. So it was more of a, we got to eat this out of convenience. Like, we don't have nothing else. We got to do what we got to do. So when people talk different. about poor, they don't understand poor life. I can never complain and say, you know what I'm saying, our country go Oh, it's worse or better. You know, like our country is actually better. Like I can't say it's worse in other places that I've got the experience. And I and I got to live someplace. I lived in Korea, Germany, um, Cuba. So I I got I got to I got to see some places. And man, when I say the poor is poor, the poor is poor. Oh, that is me. Because I never heard that things been described that way. Because we don't love us, we don't know. We only see what the media shows us at certain times, but we don't see that side at all. The way you just described it, a lot of us don't have not seen that. Media trash. I, I would say from my experience of living over there and seeing the media there, the media is trash in my book. And I say that because I got to see how the media fabricates stories. Like I remember one time we was in Afghanistan and we went through a lot of different things. Um, and when we watch the news, the news would be reporting stuff that I didn't see, wasn't happening at all. But they would say things were going on in areas that I was actually in. And me and the folks that I was around, we were looking like, what are they talking about? We here. Like, we had different stories of different things. Like, I remember when I was in Afghanistan, we heard about a uh, prison getting, um, be, um, getting raided and like 50,000 soldiers escaped. But I never saw that on the news. And nobody talked about that. You see what I'm saying? So it was like, how are they reporting this that's not happening? 
but the actual stuff that is happening, they aren't talking about that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just, it's two different sides of what's really going on. And that's why for me, even to this day, I don't watch news like that because I know from my own personal experience of living overseas, the news is in the business of selling information. Whether that information is true, whether it's false, they're in the business of selling information. They're in the business of creating narratives. I mean, that's what story writers do. I mean, that's all they are to me is they just story writers where you have in what we was taught in school, fiction and nonfiction. Well, sometimes what they're reporting is nonfictional stuff. And if you don't know that and you're so ingrained and in tune with the, what they're talking about, they can mislead you. And that's not to say all of them are bad, but I don't know enough. I, I, I can't say I, I look at them enough to figure out what is right and what's wrong. Because again, from my experience of what I went through in Afghanistan, I just don't, I don't really deal with the news. I, I don't trust it. I don't trust them as a source. I don't want to hear that stuff because I just feel like there's a lot of propaganda. And most people call it, oh, you conspiracy theorists. No, I'm a realist. I've been in places where they reported stuff and said things about stuff that really didn't exist. So if they did that then, how do I believe that now? And that's not just from being in Afghanistan. Even where I'm from in South Carolina, I remember um, an older white man and a young white girl was um, drunk, ran into a tree in front of my mom's house. And I remember this thing woke me up because me and Nicole sleeping in the living room. And all of a sudden, I heard this boom. And I jumped up thinking I was in Afghanistan, ran outside looking, trying to figure out what's going on. I see this cloud of smoke. Come to find out this, young, this older guy had this young girl. They were drinking high, whatever, whatever else was going on. So we helped them out of the situation. And then the cop came on the scene, asked us, and we saw some. My wife, my mom was like, nah, leave it alone. Don't get involved with it. I denied, you know, like I knew what was going on, but I really didn't know. But because of where we was at, I kind of left it alone. And I'm thinking like, okay, this thing is going to be on the news. Well, guess what? That situation was never on the news. That overage guy with that young girl never um brought about no charges it just went away like it didn't exist so after seeing stuff like that i know everything that's being reported in the news it's like reason behind that people aren't just reporting stuff just because it's news because i believe they would have report everything that happens America and Americans would really be on edge knowing everything that really happens. I just believe that certain things are, they have narratives behind it to where it's, it's like other things involved that we don't understand. That's why like now when a lot of black issues come on, I don't, I don't watch it. I don't read it. I don't, I don't, I don't look at it because I just know that, man, listen, that stuff can be fabricated. It's something else behind what they're saying. And I, I don't trust it. I just don't trust it because I mean, I grew up in the hood like how you do, how you did. And you know, man, crime happens there all the time. True. And you never hear no report about that stuff. Never hear nothing about it. Never. And that tells me that, you know, it's, it's just a lot more going on. Like, it's a lot more Black folks killing folks than anybody. And I'm talking about mass shootings and all that stuff. Yes. Like, drive-bys, all this stuff, but stuff like that don't get reported. It's just only when certain people, like, if the white man do something, all of a sudden, you know, it hits the news as big as... It's this and that, but it's just it's just a lot of stuff, man. It's a lot of stuff that, man, we be talking all day trying to talk about that stuff. Well, how was the police there for you, being uh, from America, you the military, and the people that actually live there, just from there? How was that experience I, for I you? Did you see people, the police there? Or? Those people look up to us because they have a different idea of what America is. Like for us, we look at it as all oh, the 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 um, oppression of black folks, this, that, and the third. But for those people, they look at that as an opportunity to advance themselves. So they see Americans different than Americans see Americans. We see each other through color. They see us as just Americans. Like that was one of the things that I had to learn a lot about. Like I remember when I was in Germany and I approached a black guy that looked like me as if he was an African. And he got highly offended by what I was saying because he looked at it as, if I'm from Germany, that makes me a German. That don't make me an African. That don't make me a descendant of an African. That makes me a German. Why? Because this is why I was born. This is why I was raised. So I'm a German. That threw me off because, again, in America, even though I'm an American, 
they consider me an African American. And for me, it's hard for me to even accept that because I'm like, bro, I'm not from Africa. I'm an American. It's one thing if I was born in Africa and raised in America, then I would be an African American. But the fact of the matter that I was born in America, I'm an American. And the way those folks approach us is as Americans, not by color, not by, I would say like your um your different classification as far as, you know, being the rich, you know, middle class and lower class, like that may exist to a certain degree, but even then they still look at you as a typical American. So when it comes to the police over there, they're very fair people. They didn't bother you and they didn't too much fool with you. But if you got out of line, they had a system in place to where it's way different. Like one thing I knew about South Korea, you get locked up there, there is no prison system that they really take care of. You got to know somebody to get taken care of there. So if you get locked up, you don't got no food, you don't got this, hey, bro, you stuck. You got to have you got to have people who know you are, who are willing to help you out because, again, they don't cater to people who are incarcerated. But then you go to Germany, on the other hand, it's more different to where they actually have like a rehabilitation thing going on to where people aren't just locked up like so say for instance you got locked up for um drugs or murder or different things like i think the max amount of time you do in germany is like 21 years whereas an american you can do life so the system is way different because they're about rehabilitating people not housing people forever and keeping them locked up that's true now we don't there's a big difference between us in America and the racism here. How did, did you see a lot of that there also? Uh, not just maybe with you, but with their own people. Were there certain blacks or certain price? You know, like who made the most money or whatever in your experience? I mean, I would say like racism. It's hard for me to say what racism is again, because again, even being from America, I never truly experienced that. And I grew up in South Carolina. Now, did I see a divide amongst people? Yes, but I didn't take it as racism. I mean, and I guess that comes from just my upbringing. Like my folks never taught me to look at people any different than myself. So even if it did exist, it probably would go past my head because I always looked at it as like where I'm from. If you're not from where I'm from, folks don't deal with you. You know what I'm saying? That's in the black community. Like we don't deal with folks outside our community, depending on the last name, you know, like we have all these different little things that folks don't talk about where folks don't deal with each other. So that's how I took being around folks of different colors or um, a nationality or whatever, what I took it as, they just aren't, they, they aren't from where I'm from. So they don't just, they just don't deal with me. And to me, I'm perfectly fine with that because I was like that, I was biased. Like when I weren't used to being around um, people from different areas, like I kind of looked at them strange. I kind of didn't engage with them. It went into I got to engage with them, you know, actually um, be around them enough to where I start understanding, like, bro, we all the same. We just people with different flavors. That's how I call it. Like, we all cook the same food, but we all enjoy different flavors of the same food. So, it, I mean, so I don't look at those people any different than myself. And that's pretty much how it seemed like it was there. That's not to say it may not have been like that, but from my perspective, I don't remember it as much. Okay, so from your perspective as well, where you lived and where you grew up, the people that you're around, when you went to the military, you saw something different. It was open yeah. to a whole different perspective of life, how people really are opposed to being in your town. Now yeah. I'm from here, so I'm from Houston. And we have all these different wards here. So it's a big city, although it was not as big in the, I grew up in the really 1960s, early, or very early 70s, but pretty much in the 60s. So we had each little part of, of, of Houston. Where you are from, how is that as far as compared to one of our wards here? It's, like, it's more like your city was like a ward that we have here in Houston? Nah, South Carolina, where I'm from, it's broken up. Like, it's, it's like, we say for instance, like, I'm from Georgetown. Georgetown County is made up of different little cities within Georgetown County. So, like, I grew up in the area, like, they call it Georgetown. But what I'm actually from, where my folks are from, they call it Pauly's Island, which is actually in Georgetown County. But where I was raised at, I was raised in an area called Plantersville, which is also in Georgetown County. 
but it's not an actual Georgetown, like as far as the city limits. So what I would say is it's actually almost sort of kind of the same as being in the big city, but it's much more smaller to where everybody know where everybody from because we all don't talk the same like where I'm from. We sound more like we from New York. We sound like more like we from the city because of um, our geographical location. But then you go someplace like in Charleston, they think all those people from Jamaica, from the island. And you can like, as soon as you hear people talk where I'm from, you know they aren't from your area because of just the way they talk or the way they carry themselves. Like you can tell all that stuff because it's so, so small to where people can't, they can mix. But you could tell, like, hey, bro, you from here? And then from Charleston, they be like, hey, boy, I ain't from here. And you're like, huh? You, where you from? They're like, oh, why you from Charleston? And then now you know, like, hey, he ain't from Georgetown. But then you hear somebody like me talk, most of the time, you're like, hey, where you from? they like, they like, you from New York or something like that? They're like, now nah, I'm from Georgetown. I'm from South Carolina. And you can tell because of just how we talk, like, this. like, I have a little bit of country slango, but then I sound like, like I have a mix of everything because... That's how it is where I'm from. Okay, I like that. So basically what you're saying is in a sense, you where you were, where you grew up, you joined the military, gave you a different perspective of life, gave you a different picture of it. Yes, sir. And that changed your, I think, your perception of a lot of things. Not just not just maybe some we considered here in, in the States racism, being black or whatever. You got to a different perspective than a lot of people have because you exposed yeah. a lot more. Yeah, even even on racism, like where I'm from, all I was ever taught was we were enslaved by white folks. It went into I got I joined the army and I met my wife that I learned that back feet that I and, and up until that point I didn't learn until that point that black folks were sold into slavery by black folks. I never knew that growing up. I, I didn't know that where I'm from in South Carolina black folks owned slaves. I never knew that. Like there's a lot of black history that I didn't learn until I actually left where I'm from. Because again, where I'm from, they only taught the white side of things. And what I mean by that is, it was always about what white folks did to us, oppression. Most folks where I'm from, they like, all oh, them buckers got us in this situation. You know, those crackers, like things like that. Like you always hear those terms, but the hear when I left South Carolina that we actually enslaved each other, I almost felt insulted and I, I got mad at black folk for a while. I, God had to really deliver me from that. I was mad because I'm like, okay, why didn't they tell us the full picture? Why it was it only a certain narrative created? Like that offended me because I'm like, bro, when I served in the United States Army with all these different group of people, they didn't treat me like what most folks would say, like a Negro. They treated me like a brother. Like I had folk from different races that would bring me into their home and show me the love and attention that I would get from home. So it's just like, it was a cultural shock joining the military. Okay, I like that. That's a good perspective that you have too. I like that different view that we 